This book is called None of These Diseases. This is the Good Spirit coming to you from the Spirit of Ecstasy channel with another book review. None of These Diseases is written by R. I. by S. I. Macmillan, M. D. S. I. Macmillan, M. D. M. C. M. I. L. L. E. N. The Bible prevents devastating disease and senseless suffering, explodes the myth of the Kinsey Report, and erases irreconcilable grief and mind-poisoning guilt. That's what this book will do. Complete and unabridged. And it uh, has no ISBN number. It's uh, been out a while. But on page... Uh, what is very good is on page 20, 26, or 27, page 27, the last paragraph. The colossal waste of life and money is preventable by obedience to the book of books. And none of these diseases is the, is the promise to those who heed the many scriptural injunctions against drunkenness. Now, this is just one chapter that where it talks about drunkenness, but it, it goes into a lot of different things which cause disease anxiety and fear and worry and so forth. But uh, against drunkenness, here is one passage that warns in crisp but colorful language of the economic, medical, and social aspects of drink, even including a description of delirium tremens. And where it goes on, where, is he, where he says, Listen, my son, and be wise, be guided by good sense. Never sit down with tipsy men or among gluttons. The drunkard and the glutton come to poverty, and reviling, reveling leaves men in rags. Who shriek, who groan, who quarrel and grumble, who are bruised for nothing, who have bleary eyes, those who linger over the bottle, those who relish blended wines. Then look not on that wine so red that sparkles in the cup, it glides down smoothly at the first, but in the end it bites like any snake. It stings you like an adder. You will be seeing odd things. You will be saying queer things. You will be like a man asleep at sea, asleep in the midst of a storm. And that's just some little something it says about drink. But where it talks about in chapter 5 about the coronary and cancer by the carton, this is uh, talking about smoking. The manager of a grocery store phoned me one day. Doctor, he said, I received a note from Mrs. Henderson, which she smuggled out of her house. Her husband is very sick, so sick that he's almost out of his head. He won't allow her to leave the house for fear she will never come back. She is afraid he may kill her. She wants you to go to her house to examine her husband. Mrs. Henderson's husband was over six feet tall. He had been a strong, muscular fellow, but now his flesh wasted away and his eyes sunk deep in their sockets. He appeared more like a ghost than a man. For months, he uh, hadn't slept well because he was coughing up masses of blood. His suffering and misery had been long and horrible. His wife was distracted and afraid of him because he had threatened to kill her if she attempted to leave him. After I questioned and examined him, a diagnosis of cancer of the lungs seemed highly probable. I made application by phone to have him admitted to the hospital, and it was a big relief to all concerned when the day of his admission arrived. However, during his first night in the hospital, he had a severe hemorrhage and drowned in his own blood. An autopsy revealed widespread cancer of both lungs. How often does this sanguinary horror occur in the lives of men and women? Every year, 35,000 Americans are strangled to death by lung cancer. This figure proclaims that no cancer statistic ever skyrocketed as high or as rapidly as lung cancer. Back in 1912, lung cancer was called the rarest of all diseases. Then in the 1920s, it began to increase. In the 1940s and 1950s, the mortality figures zoomed upward at an unbelievable rate. In England, between 1924 and 1951, the death rates shot up tenfold, while in Holland they soared twentyfold. 
in New York State in 1947, the death rate was frightening, yet even that high figure was doubled in 1957. In the country as a whole, during the past 20 years, the death toll from lung cancer increased 500%. At the present time, more men die from it than any other cancer. In fact, one out of every seven people who die of cancer has undergone the horrors of lung cancer. Authorities declare that soon every third person who dies of cancer will die of cancer of the lung. That is a far cry from 1912 when it was the rarest of all diseases. What is the cause of lung cancer? When the statistics shot it, skyward surgeons expected the cause, uh, but suspected it, but it was as late as 1949 that Dr. E.O. Whitener uh, supplied the first statistical evidence of the relationship between smoking and lung cancer. In 1950, Wander and Graham reported 684 proven cases of lung cancer in men and women. They discovered that of the 605 cases in men, only eight had been non-smokers. Uh, from England came a report from a study of 1,357 uh, uh, cases of lung cancer. In this vast group of victims, only seven non-smokers were found. Okay, well, that just shows how the connection between uh, smoking and lung cancer, which we are all aware of, that's been out for some time, that information. And uh, fortunately, we're all aware of that now, and uh, smoking is beginning to lose in popularity. But um, we will continue to look at other things in here, which... Um, On page uh, 43, it says, 3,000 years ago, our Heavenly Father sought to save us from such an end. Uh, he said, My son, attend to wisdom, bend your ear to knowledge, they, that they may save you from the loose woman. Her lips drop hunted words. Her talk is smoother than oil itself, but the end with her is bitter as poison, sharp as a sword with a double edge. Now listen to me, my son. Hold fast to what I say. Keep clear of her. Never go near her door, lest you are left at last to moan. I, oh, why did I hate guidance? Why did I despise all oh, warning? The Lord not only gives many warnings to help mankind, but Jesus so transforms and fortifies one with the energy and the power of the Holy Spirit that man has no valid excuse for falling into sexual sin. The Apostle Paul expresses the matter forcibly in his epistle to the Thessalonians. God's plan is to make you holy, and that entails, first of all, a clean cut, uh, having a clean cut with sexual immorality. Every one of you should learn to control his body, keeping it pure and treating it with respect, never regarding it as an instrument of self-gratification, as do pagans with no knowledge of God. You cannot break this rule without in some way cheating your fellow men. And you must remember that God will punish all who offend in this matter. And we have warned you how we have seen this work out in our experience of life. The calling of God is not to impurity, but to the most thorough purity. And anyone who makes light of the matter is not making light of man's ruling, but of God's command. It is not for nothing that the Spirit of God gives us the spirit that God gives us is called the Holy Spirit. It must be bitter mockery indeed for people who steal a little illicit sexual pleasure to end with sexual debility and eventual impotence. Uh, the, the type of sin, uh, this type of sin often determines, the type of sin often determines the pattern of, pun of punishment. Syphilis not only attacks the brain, causing insanity in the spinal cord, causing the excruciating pains of the locomotor ataxia, but it is frequently attacks the heart also. I remember a patient whose heart was devastated by syphilis. Though at first he denied any sexual safaris, he finally confessed that many years ago he was kind of bad. And like Skylark of old, the devil wanted his pound of flesh right out of his heart. In fact, in the United States during 1945, the death rate from cardiovascular syphilis was reputedly the cause of 40,000 deaths. The advent of penicillin reduced that figure, but we read that in 1953, the management of cardiovascular syphilis remains unsatisfactory because the pathologic changes are the result of scarring. And 
And then it gives us the what are the enemies of sexual happiness. And uh, let's uh, just give the um, chapters here. That's just a few things. And chapters are chapter one, gray hair and rattlesnake oil. Chapter two, pride and prejudice versus proof. Chapter three, science arrives 4,000 years late. Uh, chapter four, robber of five million brains. Five, coronary and cancer by the carton. Six, they have the devil to pay. Seven, the enemies of sexual happiness. Eight, the superlatives to sex. Uh, superlatives in sex. Nine, upset mind, sick body. Ten, it is not what you eat, it what's eat that what, but it's what eats you. Eleven, the high cost of getting even. Twelve, eggs, just eggs. Thirteen, love or perish. Thir Fourteen, cats and crocodiles. Fifteen, you're as old as your arteries. Sixteen, David and the giant, which is weary. Seventeen, arthritis from a panther scare. Eighteen, cutting man's greatest fear down to size. 19, see further through a tear than through a telescope. 20, mother stars. 21, the nation's number one health problem. Uh, 22, snails and schizophrenics. 23, a lesson from John D. Rockefeller. 24, don't shoot for the moon. 25, two souls, uh, alias, dwell in my breast apart. 26, freedom from an agonizing situation. One twenty six in as a young man, John D. Rockefeller Sr. was a strong and husky as a farm lad. When he entered business, he drove himself harder than any slave was ever driven by the whip of a taskmaster. At the early age of thirty five, he had made his first million dollars. You see, now this is right down uh, down our alley here, uh, making all this money uh, very quickly, and. Uh, of course, a million dollars at the time John D. Rockefeller <clears throat> made it would be several hundred million dollars today. Uh, so, uh, but we can very well see that he uh, how he got that by uh, consecrating every waking moment to do his work. He controlled at 43 the biggest business in the world. When he was 53, he was the richest man on earth and the world's only billionaire. Very good. That's what uh, we need to be is to, <laughs> to have a figure that is the world's only, such as the world's only trillionaire or quadrillionaire. Uh, that's what uh, we need to get the success idea of having. We'll be the richest one uh, for this achievement and do it. We're going to do it through ecstasy and joy, though. See, that's what, what I'm going to do with all of this. Uh, see, what this is telling you is that he... He got all that money, but he destroyed himself to, through uh, too much anxiety and worry, and that was because he didn't obey their principles, which I'm teaching here. He didn't he didn't maintain the ecstasy and the joy as he was going along, and and he didn't uh, take care of meditation and getting himself in, uh, in touch with God, letting the infinite mind give him the ideas, and turning uh, when he turned to his meditation, let the I am within talk to him and tell him how to. Uh, be patient and understanding and loving and kind and tell him how to just uh, let things go easily along take it easy but but uh, use your mind your inner infinite mind to give you the ideas uh, that the creative ideas and let that inner mind and that subconscious work and, and give you those ideas and you'll write those down in the notebook as they come you'll write those down in your journal and those ideas will work for you and you won't destroy your body. Uh, you'll have uh, uh, millions and millions of dollars and nice homes and cars and everything without destroying your body. It'll all come to you. All of this success and all these ideas will come to you easily if you turn to infinite mind. And there'll be no need to destroy yourself as John D. Rockefeller did and so that he couldn't benefit from his money. We want to be able to get it in a way that we can benefit it from it. We want to be able to benefit from our money and live to a ripe old age and continue to benefit from it.